we're out here today in a uh, cornfield that was interseeded, 60 inch rows with Luke Bergler and his family. And we're looking at the diverse cover crop mix and some of the benefits that Luke is looking to get from interseeding cover crops. So Luke, why don't you tell us a little bit about what's in the mix, you know, some of the different species and why you pick those. It's about a 19 species mix, if, uh, if you can find them all. Anything from a run of clovers, brassicas, annual ryegrass, some flax, and a handful of other ones. Seeded down about 30, 35 pounds. We uh, planted with a Gandhi air seeder in a modified rotary hoe, and uh, we just blow down on top of the ground. As scientific as it sounds, we try to time it ahead of a rain. And that's uh, the system I have in place right now, and, and so we let Mother Nature help us out a little bit. This was a bean field last year, so we had some residual bean stock, and I had it frost seeded in rye, and so when I sprayed it down, we put a little more cover on the ground also, and that helped get them seeds underneath and hold the moisture and, and help sure. it all hatch. Why did you interseed, and why did you even try 60 inch rows? First objective to interseeding when I started was soil erosion and the ability to bring cows graze stocks, but graze a higher quality feed out here with the corn stocks. 60 inch rows fell into place with realizing how much more tonnage of feed we could produce by letting more sunlight in. And the row orientation here is pretty much east-west, is that, am I correct in saying that? True east and west, yes. And last year you tried interseeding on 30 inch rows. Correct. Liked what you saw, so you did some 30 inch, some 60 inch, just mostly to get the sunlight in, is that kind of the main reason? Yeah, uh, so we put, uh, some 30 inch rows right next to the 60s. Uh, same mix, interseeded the same day, corn planted pretty much the same day, just so we had a true side-by-side -side comparison. 60 inch, and discount the narrow row. And this is back to 30s. The proof's in the pudding, you can just see it. It's a just night and day difference. Right. Still good feed here though. Different composition. There's a lot more grass showing up in here. here. It looks like than exactly the bigger brassicas and exactly yes grape and radish and right yeah huge difference. I mean, still really good feed, no doubt. Look at the leaves on this clover. Look how big them are. <laughs> Luke, can you tell us about the mixture of cover crops that you have in here? Everything from turnip, radish, rape, and kale. Five to six different clovers. There's some crimson right there, and uh, some annual ryegrass also. Some new species I threw in to try were flax and buckwheat. A lot of that worked also. What percentage increase do you think you have here compared to 30 inch rows as far as biomass? I would guess we have, we are close to 50% more biomass than the 30 inch rows um, at, at a very minimum. The reason why is 60 is producing a better cover is there's some moisture and also mainly sunlight effect. From the day the cover germinates, it has ample sunlight all the way through, whereas a 30 inch row, once that corn goes roughly knee high, it's going to shade the row over and those plants will go semi-dormant until we start drying back the corn a little bit again and it matures to gain more sunlight. Same amount of fertilizer applied with the corn planter four inches off the row. Uh, no more than uh, 100 pounds of applied nitrogen. And believe it or not, same amount of seed, just in a different layout. They're both still 30,000 in an acre. There's just more plants in the 60 inch rows. The main thing I saw is the wider rows almost grew faster, but that stands the reason competition because they're planted closer together. In our wider rows, the brassicas are more prevalent. And as you get into the narrow rows, you're gonna see a higher concentration of the ryegrass and clover. They are more shade tolerant. Did you see all these bulbs in here? Yeah, it's, it's really, it's almost challenging to walk in some areas. Um, there's a tuber. Here's a nice turnip, a couple of them here. Even the ryegrass is down in here still surviving and, and more brassica is coming. Tell us what your plan is with this field. Combine it and uh, poly wire will come up and uh, vertical fence stakes and we'll bring cow herd home. 
I'm hoping on this 40 that we can do uh, at least a couple months out here grazing. We're winding down on the grass season here. I have a couple moved left across the pasture and then I actually have some interseeded corn on the other side of the farm. We just took off yesterday. Poly wire will go up by the weekend. There's more than enough to hold them out there until this particular piece comes off and then we're going to push them this way and they'll spend the winter out here on this 40. And so when you say a couple months, that means you're not going to have to supplement with any sort of hay, no lick tubs. You think you have the good enough feed here within the corn stalks? Absolutely. Uh, we found that out in a short hurry last year that uh, we, di we didn't need any supplemental protein or, or anything. We turned them on this with the amount of green matter out here. We still had uh, quality feed and even if we freeze or a little snow cover, uh, you're going to see things like certain brassicas your annual rise and your clover are still going to hold some of that value and they're still going to hold the green color too. And let's go a little bit farther for it. So you're going to combine it, you're going to graze it. What's going to happen come spring? Spring of 21, uh, as of right now, we're going to come in no-till drill, probably a barley oat and field pea mix, no-tilled in. And one of the main reasons is for that, pulling back on some chemical and the kind of chemical I use to have the ability to interseed. If we take the oat barley pea mix as a feed, we can combat any weeds that are out here right now that may have left seed behind. So some of those like water hemp and some of those that you might have? Yep, water hemp, a, a little lamb's quarter, you know, and, and I won't deny that there's not weeds out here, but I think with putting a feed crop behind it where we can pull a cutting off, we can hopefully get some of them to germinate and take them with us. So some of the species you mentioned, you know, we have some radishes, you got a whole, actually a bunch of different brassicas out here, but you know, there's some pretty hefty size to these, you know, the, the cows aren't just gonna eat you know, the tops, they're obviously gonna... They're gonna be digging for them. Right. Mm -hmm. You have, you know, 16 inch rows here, but it's not just cow feed. I mean, you're attracting wildlife like you haven't seen. You have more deer probably in here than probably even expected. Just as a measure directly behind us, we're uh, just off the side of a waterway. I had a game camera in here and I finally took it out because I was doing seven to 800 pictures a day of just deer walking back and forth in here. Directly behind us over the hill, there are, uh, my first attempt at raising honeybees and uh, making honey. You can see some flowers in here yet, um, but we've had a flowering crop in here all year and just the amount of birds. It just benefits everything right down to the soil health also. Luke has a lot of the different soil health principles at play as far as armoring the soil, you're minimizing you know, disturbance as far as no till, the corners planted no till. We just dug this up and you know, I have purple top turnip, but what really caught my eye was Mm -hmm. That night crawler, you know, what I would call an underground conduit that takes water from the surface and straight yeah, down into subsoil. Yeah. And, and look at all the fine fibers yeah. coming off all of the covers, really helping with compaction and aerating the soil also. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, the soil has a ways to go. You can still see the compaction some of the layers. planes there. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but as it gets more like cottage cheese, you know, it'll stay. Here's an There's a worm right there. So you're already starting to see some improvements, you know, like just roots that are going straight down and cycling nutrients down in the subsoil profile mm -hmm. and yeah. Isn't this the flax here? Yep, the flax in the seed. Actually, here's the neat, watch this. Here's his pods and if I grab a dry pod and crush him up, you can see his seeds come out right there. We made a big batch of chicken feed out of that this year. I only had a few acres just as a test run, and I'm gonna say off a few acres, we pulled probably 180 bushels. So it did roughly 60 bushel the acre. It was a nurse crop ahead of a new seeding alfalfa field, is what it was. I had nine species in there, and uh, I got all nine to hard grain, and we swathed and combined it. Worked very well. We ground it in a hammer mill and cut it with a little bit of corn every day and, and feed some of that. And it brought my feed costs down tremendously and gave my ground a little different rotation. There's about 40 hens there and about 15, 20 of them are young hens just coming into production. You know, there's guys trying to market seed or as feed, you know, a grain for uh, either poultry feed or livestock feed. The sky's the limit. I think your imagination is uh, the biggest limiting factor. I farm here with my wife Holly and my three daughters, Willa, Malia, and Emery. They are 11, 9, and 5. They're a big help. Everything from uh, picking the occasional rock to, to rotating cows. It's been an interesting summer. We did a lot of rotations on a 24-hour schedule. We are uh, constantly pulling fence and building fence. 
To get them even a little more excited, I have them started with a small flock of laying hens. They show a big interest. Yeah. And to keep things fun, I brought each of my goat home. There's a method behind that madness of owning goats. And for me, is next year we're gonna move them into some of my woodlands to help manage some of the invasive species, your buckthorn, your prickly ash and stuff. And I wanna try my hand at doing that in a way that isn't mechanical and so time consuming. Every farmer's hope that one of their kids wants to take over. Honestly, if that doesn't happen, I just want my daughters to have the understanding what it takes to have something start to finish. How hard that is. The fruits of your labor to getting a corn from the bag to the combine or a chicken to the egg to the sale or a calf up to harvest weight to provide for, for your family. I, I just think that's real important that uh, they have that in their upbringing. To watch the responsibility they've taken with the chickens, all dad does is put the feed there. They just handle it. The water, the picking eggs, cleaning the coop, they take care of the goats. They keep books on that little business too, which I think for a nine and 11 year old to keep a somewhat accurate ledger is phenomenal. Really fun to watch from a dad's perspective. So I'm second generation, um, not on the original farm. Uh, we had the opportunity to buy this about 13 crop seasons ago, I believe. I don't measure in years, I measure in crop seasons. My dad farms about six, seven miles to the south. I'm thankful for that. Shared equipment and stuff to get my start. Very hard for a young guy to be in this business this day and age, but we've built it up a little bit and I own some acres and I, I rent more acres and, and we just keep plugging along. The grass waterway was cost shared by NRCS. I believe that was 10 years ago maybe. 100% of my perimeter fencing was also in a program through the NRCS, which I'm thankful for, giving the ability to, uh, I feel, start out with a good solid foundation of perimeter fence, high tensile fence, something that I don't think I would have done if the cost share of the backing wasn't available. It was not just the fence, it was also watering. You have an above ground pipeline uh, and some watering yeah, facilities. Absolutely. Uh, about 12,000 foot of one inch water line above ground with portable tanks for my multi paddock uses. With rotating more and more, I've put in more bibs. I carry a couple hundred feet of garden hose and we just keep stretching water everywhere we need it. It's a, it's a useful tool. And I know one other thing you mentioned is sort of the waterway you put in with NRCS, but at this, about the same time you also put in a, a pond or a grade stave structure below it. We built the pond in conjunction to build the waterway, but we thought it'd be best to start at the bottom and build our way up the hill to hold what we would do across roughly two and a half years. Relationship with soil and water, uh, Lance is probably the main one. Uh, awesome resource. We've traveled some miles looking at other guys' crops and taking in some field days and such. A lot of it is, uh, it's a part of your network. So throwing ideas back and forth, seeing what we're doing, just what we're doing here today. Tell us about this waterway. You did this with the local NRCS office. Yes, sir. Uh, we did it in two stages. Um, took about two and a half years. They basically started from scratch and we built a big pond below it. It's a good project overall. Honestly, the first thing that led me in this direction was erosion. We were in multiple wet years and just fixing ditches, fixing waterways, just things weren't working. Uh, fuel consumption with tillage. I'm pretty much a one-man show when it comes to row cropping. The girls are a little young yet to be on the tractors. I do work an off-farm job, so it's, it's farm until midnight. I, I don't want to do that anymore. We start no-tilling and cover cropping. It changes rotations, it changes what you're doing certain times of the year. I'm actually pretty proud to say I have had dinner with my family more times this year than I think I have in the last five years. It's embarrassing, but to admit that, it's a hard thing to admit, but I was that guy. I would just go, go, go. Um, we've taken it back. I like to, in my mind, I call it back to basics. It's what's important. Um, it's the erosion, it's feeding the soil health, it's feeding the cattle or letting the cattle feed themselves. And I don't have to do chores. Um, the sheer amount of money that isn't spent blows my mind until you get in there. Here I have a yield goal of 140 bushel. Most guys think I'm crazy. If I can pull 140 corn off of here and put these cows out here, 
for 30 days, it's a done deal. It doesn't always have to be the returned cash from the crop. If I'm hauling at minimum two bales of hay, and let's just use a round figure for easy math of $50 a bale, and if you're buying $50 hay, I wanna know your source. That's $100 a day. Mm -hmm. Let's do that on 30 days. $3,000, right? Yep. Um, $30 an acre. It, it pencils out. Here's the thing along with feeding hay. If the cows are feeding themselves, I'm not out here. I'm at home having dinner with the family, or I'm working on something else, or maybe we can take a three-day trip because the cows are taking care of themselves. A lot of little things. Uh, quality of life. Right. And then even kind of fast forward to next year, because of what you've been doing as far as feeding the soil, the underground herd, the biology, you have an opportunity to cut back on some of your, your inputs as far as commercial fertilizer, that type of thing. Absolutely, I already have a rough idea where I'll be, but we're, I'm gonna pull off the nitrogen usage even a little more than I did this year, yes. And uh, using things like a, a small grain and pea crop as feed to come in here, as opposed to a bunch of chemical to take care of anything, I see that kind of as a win-win, and it's a, a whole different rotation than the ground is used to. There are a lot of people out here that would try new things, but maybe don't have what it takes to take that first step. Uh, start simple, two, three, four-way mix. It doesn't take a big sophisticated PC equipment. Our very first try out, myself and a neighbor, we were out here with a hand spreader and a five gallon pail full of seed. And we just did it by hand, just to see what's gonna happen. So if you wanna start, I would say start simple. The guy with the cattle, I truly believe has the biggest benefit. The guy without the cattle, I still think there's enough benefit to try it. 60 inch rows are quite extreme for a lot of people. Um, this is not in eyesight of the main road, but it will be next year. That's when a lot of questions get asked. And honestly, when it comes right down to it, I have never had so much fun, and I've always maybe been just a touch different, so this just suits me. Do I get a lot of flack from my neighbors? Absolutely. Um, but it's, it's worth every bit of it.